Communications, Marketing, and Business Development. Can everybody hear me? And I have a good sound online too. Thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to welcome you to the 59th Annual Harriet Cook Carter Lecture at Duke School of Nursing. It's especially exciting to be able to invite you here and for all of us to be together in person. This first time we're together for Harriet Cook Carter since 2019. Um, this is a long-standing treasured annual event for the school, and it's wonderful to welcome you physically here to the Christine Siegler Pearson Building. Today's program is a hybrid format, and so I want to share a few logistics with you. For those in the live audience, for the most part, you're going to experience this event like you experienced all other in-person events prior to the pandemic. Hopefully you remember how that went. <laughs> aware though that the microphones that are above you in the ceiling are picking up sound for our online audience so be careful what you whisper <laughs> when we reach our q a we're going to be able to take questions both from attendees online and in the room we're going to ask that those who are in the room step to the microphones and ask their pose their question introduce yourself pose your question and we will also have a virtual advocate who is fielding questions from attendees who are online, who will be able to enter their questions into the feature um, on Zoom. Today's program is presented in English with simultaneous Spanish interpretation available for our online participants. If you are in Zoom and interested in listening in Spanish, click on the globe symbol and then switch to the Spanish channel. You can also view live closed captioning. And so it's now my pleasure to introduce Dean Vincent Guillermo Ramos. He is the 12th Dean of Duke School of Nursing, the second alumni dean, the first male nursing dean, and the first Latino dean at Duke. Dean Ramos is a nurse practitioner duly licensed in primary care and psychiatric mental health nursing. He's maintained an active research portfolio with extensive funding from the NIH, CDC, and other federal agencies and private foundations. He's been a leader in reducing health disparities among youth in Latino communities and is also the director of the Center for Latino Adolescent and Family Health at Duke. It's a pleasure to turn this over to him. Dean Ramos. Thank you very much, Judy. And thank you all the members of uh, the Duke University School of Nursing community, as well as our colleagues across campus and in the field of healthcare for joining us this afternoon. I am Vincent Guillermo Ramos, the Dean of the School of Nursing and Vice Chancellor for Nursing Affairs. And I am so pleased to be here today for the 59th annual Harriet Cook Carter Lecture. This annual lecture is named in honor of Harriet Cook Carter a nurse and honorary member of the Alumni Association of the Duke University School of Nursing. The Harriet Cook Carter Lecture serves to stimulate ideas for improving nursing education, service, research in both the academic and professional arenas. It is my great pleasure to introduce our guest today, Dr. Sylvia Trent Adams, who will address the role of nurses in nursing and public health disaster preparedness. With the recognition of the ways uh, COVID-19 has forever changed the profession. Dr. Trent Adams uh, will discuss how to optimize nursing's contributions to improving public health and recognizing all aspects of health and equity. Dr. Trent Adams is the Executive Vice President and Chief Strategy Officer at the University of North Texas Health Science Center at Fort Worth. In this role, she assists the president in developing, communicating, executing, and sustaining strategic initiatives and planning with a focus on accelerating organizational performance. Before joining the University of North Texas, Dr. Trent Adams served as the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for Health for the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Through this position, she and the Assistant Secretary for Health shared responsibility for planning, coordinating, and directing substantive program and policy matters for the full range of public health activities within the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health. Between 2015 and 2018, she served as Deputy Surgeon General for the U.S. Public Health Service Commission Corps, where she was a trusted advisor to the Surgeon General, providing support on critical issues and central initiatives of the Commission's Corps. During her term, she was awarded the Surgeon General's Medallion for her service as Acting Surgeon General from April uh, 2017 to September 2017. 
Prior to that, she served as Deputy Associate Administrator for the HIV AIDS Bureau Health Resources and Services Administration, where she managed the $2.3 billion Ryan White program. In these roles, Dr. Trent Adams has focused on improving access to care for underserved populations and under-resourced communities. One of my goals in joining Deuce on this Dean has been to improve health equity and outcomes for real people, families, and communities by embracing the importance of nursing and addressing the social determinants of health, a goal very closely aligned with Dr. Trent Adams' focus throughout her career. Dr. Trent Adams is a registered nurse and a fellow of the National Academies of Medicine, the American Academy of Nursing, and the National Academies of Practice. She received her BSN from Hampton University, her Master's of Science in Nursing and Health Policy from the University of Maryland, Baltimore, and a PhD in Public Policy from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Please join me in warmly welcoming our distinguished visitor for the 59th annual Harry Cook Carter Lecture, Dr. Silva Trent Adams. Well, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for that warm welcome, um, Dean Ramos. I'm so glad to be here. It's still so unusual to be in front of people, with people. And um, I'm so glad to be able to be in, in person once again. So uh, it's especially heartwarming for me to be here at, um, on the campus of Duke University, but more, even more so within the School of Nursing. Um, it's, it's always nice to be around fellow colleagues, but this school has a, has a storied history and so much of the work that you do here is felt around the world. And my interest in global health is it resonates with all the incredible work that's being done here. Um, um, Dean Ramos, I wanna thank you for your vision. I've heard you talk about what you want to accomplish in your role as Dean here. And I look forward to all that you are, will accomplish. Your leadership and your incredible accomplishments that precede you before you got here to Duke will only prepare you for a bright and storied future as well, contributing to the history and your legacy here at, um, at Duke. I wanna say thank you to the faculty and staff and for all the students in, in, this, in the Duke University School of Nursing family. Thank you for all that you've endured during the, the past two and a half years around with COVID. And thank you for what you continue to do, especially to the faculty and the staff to support the students who are the future. We're gonna need somebody to take care of us one day and I'm glad you trained the, the best and the brightest. <laughs> so let me move on. Um, as, we, as we look at my topic for today, I just want to, want to take, an op take the opportunity to recognize the importance of public health, public health preparedness and response. Looking at nursing, but I want to take a, take a walk back in time to look at how we got to a state of public health emergency prior to COVID. So today I will present on the topic, the new normal, preparedness for better health. Where do we go from here? Let me just make my disclosure up front. I have no financial disclosures that would be a potential conflict of interest with this presentation. I wanted to talk about the um, objectives I want to accomplish today. The, the objectives for this presentation are to discuss public health disasters and the threats presented by infectious diseases and the healthcare system in general. Um, we'll talk about the approaches for preparedness and response globally. And we'll also explore, explore global burden of disease in relationship to healthcare and how nursing can have an impact on public health, global health going forward. And I want to also to mention how nurses can engage, where they need to engage, and the roles and expectations of nursing past COVID. Once we get to past COVID. Um, so let's first set the stage. Post COVID will look a lot different than um, life before the pandemic. And there are some factors we need to, to consider before we can really process the potential for what we will be doing as a profession and what reality will bring. I'm going to talk about, I'm going to ask you to bear with me for a few minutes because I have a few slides that's going to basically be a refresh on how we got here. And I want to look at some of the supporting information that will help us to frame the impact of a disease outbreak, a pandemic, or um, a resurgence of previous, previous um, diseases, 
and the continued path of health disparities going into the future. All of these represent a type of disaster within the healthcare system at some level. And it is that disaster, the disaster that we're seeing across the country as it relates to health disparities, gaps, inequities, social justice reform, and also looking at the structural challenges that we face in the healthcare delivery system in the United States also and also abroad. I decided to approach this in a pragmatic way that may help us to put things into context. So I decided to use a familiar framework. Yes, I am a nurse, and I'm unapologetic. <laughs> so I, I won't ask them for a raise of hands if, any, if this looks familiar to anyone. <laughs> for the students in the room, know your dean did not insist I use the nursing process for the presentation. And for the, the faculty, um, I want you to know I, I support you, and I want, to, I want to instill the importance of nurse, the nursing process for the students so that, just in full disclosure, I use the nursing process in problem solving every day. It has become a way of thinking, has become a way of life and how I address problems, whether it be clinical, business or research. I actually use the nursing process in a way that allows me to level set problem versus rhetoric. And today we will look at these steps to better understand the preparedness and disaster framework and how we can address threats to public health going forward. So let me just take a look at the, this slide with you. And this slide presents the most recent data available for leading causes of death in the United States. This data is reported annually, and this, is, this data reflects 2020. As you can see, only three of the leading causes of death are from infectious diseases. The other seven are from chronic diseases or preventable causes. This, is, this resonated with me because we have been so focused on number three for the last two years. It didn't exist prior to this data collection from 2020. So what I wanted to share is that there are things that we need to do differently as it relates to looking at how do we approach the pandemic post COVID and preparedness and response, but how do we address the known um, causes of death that are within our span of control as nurses to prevent those types of chronic diseases being a, an ongoing threat to national security as well as um, global security. So I want to take this, look at this next slide because this is a, a, a glance at the global landscape from a more longitudinal perspective. Let's look at the differences in the causes of death in 2000 and more recently in 2019. And as you can see on, on this slide for 2019, for the global health assessment, there was no COVID listed on this slide. Second, the increase in the number of deaths associated with some of the leading causes of death with advances in healthcare technology and science should be puzzling to all of us. What we've done in the cancer space, what we've done in cardiovascular disease, both from an intervention standpoint, prevention messaging and new drugs in the market, we are still looking at significant um, gaps and even more so um, developing gaps over time. And that is a threat to our preparedness and response capabilities. And I'll explain that to you a little bit later in more detail. Based on a report from the Kaiser Family Foundation, this graphic um, depicts the rate of uninsured of non-elderly populations in the United States in 2018 and 2020. As you can see here, um, there are dis the disparities between most minority populations and whites. And Asians tend to trend in not only in un the uninsured population, but in access indicators. Those indices between those two populations are usually pretty close. But for the other minority populations, there is a significant gap. <clears throat> this underscores some of the access to care and delayed care challenges for minorities during the COVID response. But it's not the entire scope of the challenge. There are other issues not accounted for um, in, other than insurance status. Uh, geography, access to providers, living within a certain, ge um, certain um, uh, driving distance or transportation distance between um, providers and, and access to care has also been indications of how individuals will fare with respect to access to care and health outcomes. In this slide, we see the depiction of data from the, another one from the Kaiser Family Foundation of people of color and rates of infection, hospitalization, and the death of COVID by race. Minority populations represented higher numbers of cases, hospitalizations, and deaths from COVID-19. These data are important in understanding the impact of COVID-19 locally and globally. But the issue is not just about access during the pandemic. There are other factors that must be examined as a part of the process as we move forward. 
the structural challenges that we talked about, and this is about um, how we address um, access to healthcare, but more importantly, how do we address the health needs of a community when we are in the healthcare environment and not, in, not understanding the needs of the community. Causes of death, insurance status and COVID outcomes are a part of a bigger challenge. These challenges are driven by the social determinants of health and how we look at those determinants in the context of public health and our delivery system more broadly. The Kaiser Family Foundation published this model several years ago, and it, cha it challenges us to think about the social and the economic inequities of health and healthcare systems in the United States and globally. Keep this in mind as we now move into the discussion about the preparedness and response. There are many approaches to preparedness and response. Um, most are driven by the civ mill, civilian, and the military models that have, been that have been developed and used not only by the United States military, but also by other um, militaries across the world, meaning that civilian and military sectors partner during a disaster or national response need to be able to build capabilities and, and build that infrastructure for response. Globally, the WHO, the UN, and the Red Cross are other examples known for their humanitarian models, um, and they provide aid and relief as a part of a response to disasters as well. Nonprofits and faith-based organizations also lead and participate in these coordinated efforts. And as we saw with COVID, that's not enough. So let's just dive into response and preparedness a little bit more deeply. So in a literal sense, response is something that is done and reacted to something. COVID happened, we reacted. The cases started to rise, even more significantly in certain parts of the country. We ramped up our capabilities. We started to pull our resources together to respond to the increased need. Preparedness though. Here is where we need to focus our attention because this is really the game changer. Preparedness is being ready for something. It is the state of being prepared. And that is where we, as a global community, have not done our homework. Many communities did not even have the ability to track cases. They did not have the capabilities to do contact tracing. And this hampered our ability to be able to very early on capture the burden of disease in a given community, let alone stem the tide of growth. Much of the work that, has, that needs to be done is based off of a set of principles and is the foundation for preparedness. And it requires what we all know we do in nursing, we do in hospital preparedness every day, which is we have to have a plan. Every community in this country should have a plan. And I remember working on the pan flu, um, pandemic flu plans in the, in the 90s, and we put those plans, we put the requirement for plans across the entire country, every community, every community health center, every county health department, every state department, state health department was required to have a pandemic, recluse, a pandemic flu response. Those plans were developed, they were beautiful. Some of them had lots of colors and charts and graphs and people responsible. And we put it on the shelf. Put it on the shelf. And then we didn't do anything with it. We don't, not only need a plan, we need plans, we need exercises, we need engagement. We need to talk to the community. We need to know who we are working with on a daily basis. And I'm not talking about the person in the office next door to you. I'm talking about really getting out into the community and understanding how to engage the people that we serve. It is about knowing who's at, who are the faith-based leaders. It is knowing who are the hospital leaders, who will be in the homeless community, and who owns the barbershops, who owns the beauty salons, who runs the laundromat, and who runs the gas station, and who has the toilet paper. <laughs> <laughs> but planning and doing exercises and having engagement um, don't do us any good if we don't train together. One of the biggest challenges, and I will say at the federal level, leading some of the testing um, apparatus at, at HHS and help, help, helping to support um, the development of vaccine distribution strategies, I learned that um, it, within a given community, states don't know who, who, their, who their partners are. And um, even community-based organizations were challenged because they just didn't have the resources. Schools were closing. Parents had to be off from work. Hospitals were having you know, staffing challenges. We had not trained people to respond in this type of environment, and that is going to be critical. That when you get a call, what do you do? If you don't have enough, what do you do? If you don't have enough physicians or nurses or social workers, what do you do? You have to have a plan for resilience, but you also have to have that accountability for, if this doesn't work, then what's my plan? A, B, C, and D. And then the outreach assessment. 
Um, so developing a plan, putting it on the shelf doesn't work. Um, exercise, having exercises, but no one actually knows what their role is or the role changes as, as the healthcare delivery system changes. Um, we have to have that outreach assessment to know that we are constantly updating our rosters. Has anybody ever worked in the hospital, and, and I, I, I'm going to date myself, and you had to actually physically call someone to, to, to cover the shift, and <laughs> you didn't have text, you didn't have email, and it was the wrong number, or it says, I'm sorry, this number is no longer in service. <laughs> you have to have constant refresh of information, and you have to know that your outreach is going to be effective, and that comes from doing your outreach assessment. Are the people you're talking to able to do the things that you need them to do in the event of an emergency? Let's talk about our preparedness and planning. Typically, when we're in a preparedness or response posture, and I speak from the military as well as from the civilian sector, something bad has happened. It means a hurricane has hit South Florida, it's coming across Louisiana, or there's a wildfire in California, or COVID just knocked on my door. Help is needed from outside of the community to address a crisis or emergency. Typically, when these things happen, you need all, boot, all hands on deck and boots on the ground to start moving quickly. I cannot stress the importance of engaging the community and allowing development of relationships to improve the likelihood of good outcomes, but also so that people feel empowered and they feel like they're part of the solution. This did not work well in COVID. If anything, People felt like they were alienated, isolated, and were not a part of the solution. Planning is critical, but building relationships is more important. Exercises can build collaboration and muscle memory. And that means that when you get together, if you train together, you're more than likely to be able to get to a place where everybody can successfully practice and practice safely. Um, but strategies can provide a pathway to vision, to the vision um, and, and the desired outcome and, and improve the overall mission and support the community. And what I mean by that is we have to be inclusive and deliberate. We can't let someone else just dictate for us how we will respond and what that response mechanism will require. So I just wanted to just give you an idea of what emergency preparedness looks like in a, in a diagram. And this is the model that we use in training exercises for FEMA. Um, every, every agency um, within the federal government at HHS, Department of Energy, we all have a set of um, requirements for our roles in, the, in an emergency response. And I'll share those with you a little bit later. But it starts with prevention. And it really is about having a plan, strategically aligning all the capabilities for HHS or, or, and all the subsidiary agencies. So just full disclosure, CDC is under HHS, not separate and distinct. Um, it is not its own department. Just want to say that. And part of, part of the challenge is messaging what each agency is responsible for and what they're not responsible for. Um, and then figuring, figuring out how do we mitigate risk of outbreaks? How do we mitigate the risk of a response not having the capabilities that it needs early on to decrease the likelihood of exacerbation of that, of that, um, of that disaster or that emergency? And preparedness, response, recovery. Recovery is important because often communities feel isolated after, specifically after a hurricane. There's a lot of damage. FEMA needs to come in. HHS needs to do have that coordinating function. But by law, constitutionally, the states have responsibility for health. And the roles and responsibilities for HHS are limited. Pandemics, though, are a little bit different. And the response capabilities for a pandemic HHS does have quarantine authority, but it's a limited authority. It cannot tell states you have to shut down. It cannot tell counties that you have to open back up. What they can do is provide guidance, advice, and consultation. CDC, however, has a national response capability and obligation for quarantine authority. So within the Health and Human Services Department, quarantine authority sits with the Centers for Disease Control, and it's, it is specifically designed under the Public Health Service Act to decrease the likelihood of an infectious contagion being spread across the United States and being a national threat. So this response, um, emergency preparedness and response capabilities was very important for us during COVID. Although not always adhered to, it is the plan. Our plan is just that, it's a plan. And when things don't go according to your plan, you have to pivot. 
it happens every day and in the clinical world and it, it also happens when we're dealing with a pandemic. Planning makes it possible to manage the entire life cycle of the potential event. The FEMA model establishes steps for planning, planning and operations, and it allows you to set priorities for each of the entities that are involved in that event. The model helps stakeholders learn their roles as a part of that response. But nowhere does it tell us in that response model where nurses fit. Nowhere in the model does it say that nurses can or can't do any of the roles and responsibilities. And I think that we'll talk about a little bit later, nurses have a significant role in that response capability. Um, strategic and operational planning um, helps us to establish priorities. It helps us to identify the levels of performance and capability requirements, but all, it also provides the standards for accessing capabilities. It helps us, to, helps us to learn what the stakeholders need and they can learn their roles. So let me just break that down. Stakeholders drive a lot of the resources in a given community. We cannot dictate to community-based organizations, hospitals, or, or the county health departments what they bring to the table during a response, at least not from the federal or from the state level. States can drive the state um, functions very clearly. But when you have a state that doesn't have jurisdiction over county health departments, things can get really distorted. So in those instances, it is critical for stakeholders in the community, the citizens, the community-based organizations, the healthcare providers, to understand who's responsible for what doing a response because there will be duplication of effort and a waste of efficiencies and effectiveness. Now I wanna to move towards um, what, happened in the, what happened with um, COVID as, as public health was put on, the, on center stage. COVID presented many challenges and, the, and opportunities. Public health took center stage on a global scale in a way that it had not ever been experienced, at least in my lifetime. So let's look at why the public health community and the preparedness and response model were so interconnected with, global, with a global public health response and why those capabilities were important. Let's talk about what happened. First of all, we had a fragile and uncoordinated public health infrastructure. There are some health departments across the country that did not have an epidemiologist. They did not know how to run the statistics. They didn't have the adequate staff to assess infection control. They had healthcare um, institutions calling them for help, such as nursing homes and um, adult living, assisted living facilities calling them because the rising cases and the infrastructure just not, couldn't support it because it just wasn't there. There were gaps in surveillance, both domestically and globally. We just didn't have the data, didn't have the information. Um, changes in weather patterns across over, over time, as you saw, we had, had a hurricane in the middle of, of COVID and we, had not, we didn't plan for it. And so therefore we put people into close quarters as a matter of survival and we saw spikes in disease outbreak. We have mobile populations. I don't know if any of you have ever moved um, in your lifetime, but <laughs> We have some generations that are a little bit younger than me. They like to move. <laughs> Our populations are more mobile now, and not just domestically, internationally. Kids are, I should say kids, students are doing study abroad programs in, in middle, high, middle and high school. They're also doing it more in, at the collegiate level. So our mobile populations present another threat for us, and we didn't understand how that was going to impact shutting down airports in the middle of the pandemic. And then think about how families would, would, would adjust being separated over a span of time, sometimes for months, stranded in foreign countries are, is, can be a scary thing. But we had a, a cycle of health disparities and inequities that had been persisting, especially in the United States, for many, many years. It has not been checked. That fact alone fractured not only communities, but our healthcare delivery system to a scale that I don't think we'll, we have yet to recover from. We have a sick care system, not a prevention approach as overall in the United States. And we have an aging population that we have under, understaffed because we don't have enough geriatric specialists and we don't have enough gerontologists to plan. And we don't have a strategic initiative around meeting those needs longer term as baby boomers continue to age. Therefore, all of this led to increased demands on the healthcare delivery system and a crash course in what do you do in a pandemic? So our current state, we're in a, we're in a, we're in, we're in the still in the middle of a pandemic. We have epidemics happening routinely, not off the wall. There's, these are not one-offs anymore. 
They're happening on a regular basis. Natural disasters have increased. Man-made disasters are happening. We're living through one right now. And we also have a humanitarian crisis in the middle of, of Europe. We have wars and rumors of wars, and those things are happening on a regular and cyclical basis, political and social unrest, cyber risk, especially to healthcare institutions, and chem bio threats by the day. So where are we, America? Where are we, nursing profession? I think this is an opportunity, an opportunity for nursing to take its place at the table for leading and guiding public health and also preparedness and response. The most important competency we, competencies we've identified are listed here. And this is based off of, of a study that was done um, at HHS and also coordinating with several institutions across, it, across the world. Um, and when you're engaging in, in, in global and also domestic crises, cultural awareness and cultural competency are critical. And I will say that I've gone into Sub-Saharan Africa on HIV missions um, over the years, and I've also was responsible for the um, Ebola, leading the um, USG response in Ebola in 2014. And I will tell you, language is golden. If you can't talk to people, you can't convey your thoughts, you can't convey your intent, and you will have a breakdown in communication that could lead to a disaster. Um, we have to be con cognizant of that. We have to have diplomacy, understanding that it's not about what we want, that I mentality has to be put aside. It is all about the community and making sure that we're meeting the needs of those who are in need. Communication, coordination, triage, case management, administrative oversight, supply chain management became very critical in all the disasters that I've been a part of, but especially during COVID. We talk about toilet paper, like it was a hot commodity. It was like, it was gold. <laughs> um, wipes, you know, hand sanitizer. The market shifted so quickly and I've never seen the stock of Parker and Gamble go up so fast, it's, been, it's amazing. But we need to think about those things as we plan um, public health responses at the local level. But how do we train our students today to think about the business model for healthcare and what it means for them to be a provider in a system that is fractured, mobile, and has lots of need for change? Where do they insert themselves? How does their research, how their science, and how does their evidence help to change the views, perspectives, and practices of those of us in the public health space. We talk about resilience, but I don't think we give it enough credit in how we survive to stay today. And I think that's yet to be um, better understood because of COVID. I think resiliency is, is important, but it also needs to, it comes, with a, it comes with a price. And the caveat is that we need to figure out how we define resilience. Is resilience defined, did you survive? There's this old saying that what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. No, what doesn't kill you can also lead to a lot of stress and burnout long-term in your lifespan. So I would, I would challenge us all to think about how do we build a model that is user-friendly for, for resilience that allows us to heal, to grow, and also to teach others how to use that information um, more, more conducively. As you think about um, COVID and coming out of this, this pandemic, um, eight in 10 adults say that normal life will look different going forward. Yahoo. <laughs> um, but I think that there are factors here on this, on this slide that talk about, and this is again, one of the, the Kaiser studies, um, the future will look different, but we can guide what the future looks like based on what we choose to do right now. And that it goes for nursing, how nursing shows up, how public health will reframe a lot of the preparedness and response conversation, but providing leadership. I know that there are things that we are, all of us are really busy. We're incredibly busy, but we have to find the time to be a part of the conversation and find space where we can be a part of this, the discussion around having leadership from the clinicians, from the frontline providers, most of whom are nurses. And finding a, finding a place for us to share our leadership globally. There's a desperate need for nurses to be at the table at the WHO and also at the, um, at, at the UN. So let's look at some of those global um, perspectives. Health and healthcare are indeed global issues. If we didn't know this before COVID, we should know it now. Um, disease is global. Cardiovascular disease is a leading cause of death, not only in the United States, but also abroad. We talk, I presented that on the on a chart earlier but we have got to figure out how do we lead and help people to understand that global health impacts everyone. That it's, we have to be a part of that knowledge transfer, information sharing, 
communication um, developing. And what I mean by communication developing, having a common shared language. Um, nurses in Botswana are no different than nurses in the United States. The nurses that are in, I'll talk about my experience in Malawi. The nurses in Malawi taught me so much about community engagement, about using what you've got when you don't have what you want. Nurses do that every day, but it's hard to do in a pandemic. And coming out of this, I think the, the power of learning from nurses who had to make it up on the fly should be captured, should be captured and shared around the globe because those kinds of things will be needed desperately as we move forward. An infectious disease in one country is a threat to all. And this is something that Dr. Fauci talked about almost every day in his briefings. Um, as, a part of, as a part of the dynamic of understanding infectious disease in and of itself, it's infectious. It will travel. It will mutate. It will find a home. It will find a host. It will find an environment. It will live on until it burns out. And if there's a disease threat to one country, there's a threat to the global community. And it's a, it's a threat to society and humanity. And I'm going to scoot through these um, slides because emerging infectious diseases versus re-emerging infectious diseases is important for us to keep in mind. Now, we consider COVID an, an emerging infectious disease, but SARS in and of itself is a re-emerging infectious disease. That distinction is important when we're talking about public health planning. Polio in Nigeria. TB. How many of us knew that we had almost eradicated TB? I dealt with multi-drug resistant TB every single day in my days at Walter Reed. And it is emerging over and over and over again because we have, we, we, got, we got lazy, we become lax. We put the plan on the shelf and left it there. We cannot let this be our future. We must train the nurses of tomorrow how to engage and how to understand the importance of staying abreast of all those threats to not only, infection, not only to the infectious disease um, life cycle, but to public health and communicable disease safety. The factors that encourage the spread of disease, we talked about this a little bit earlier, but I wanted to use this slide to kind of hammer home the social determinants of health, poverty, the social determinants of health in, in and of itself. It is a key factor. Kids who grow up in poverty are more likely to have, not have health insurance, they're more likely to have low educational attainment, and they're more likely to be unemployed. If you're unemployed, you're likely to be uninsured. If you're uninsured, then you can't have housing, you can't have access to healthcare. So this dynamic of poverty, especially for young children, children of color, is significantly important for us to consider as we think about how, we, how we're going to address the other factors of malnutrition and creating resources for, um, for individuals who have chronic diseases. I love the fact that we have telehealth resources, but my, my family that lives in rural Virginia, along with that, they don't have broadband. And so saying that you can just have your cardiac visit as a part of your telehealth follow-up is not gonna happen. So um, the inadequacies of the healthcare delivery system, not understanding um, international travel and commerce. People, we have a global community. We, we, we decided that we were gonna send a lot of our workforce overseas. Well, at some point they need to come home to the mothership to train. And so we're bringing all those um, potential contagions into the United States. We need to be aware of how that works in the global community. And I'll, this is just for reference, um, agent host environment. I just talked about that in, in some detail, but it is important for us to understand that the agents, the host and environment are part of the viral cycle. And if we are susceptible hosts, as with COVID, those viruses will pick up within our bodies and, and wreak havoc. So disaster management, uh, you know, they said pictures worth a thousand words. So let me just give you one picture worth a thousand words. This is just a, this is a collage of pictures that represent what life has been like, not the last 100 years. This is all within the last five years. Hurricanes, floods, tornadoes. That is um, the Princess Royal of the um, cruise ship that we basically ended up having to engage with them. Um, opioid epidemic. Um, Ebola down that bottom corner. Um, this, this is 10 years of 2014. And then we have this cycle of poverty and, and, and homelessness. So I wanted to just kind of refresh on the, the four phases of the disaster cycle. I will say that we are in constant need of refresh on how we're going to address disaster management going forward. 
we don't seem to understand in this country how to plan, execute, and evaluate in real time and be able to decrease the likelihood of disasters being um, a disruption in, in the American life. Um, these are the emergency support functions. Um, and I, just, I wanted to focus on ESF-8. This is a resource for you all to just um, understand that public health and medical services is the only thing that H is not the only thing that HHS func um, fo functions on. It also focuses on ESF-6, which is mass care, mass care emergency assistance, temporary housing and human services. So that is why we have ASPA. This is the Secretary for Preparedness and Readiness and they work very closely with FEMA. Um, and also globally, we often partner with the State Department with USAID, the United States um, Agency for Assistance and in development, in development. I want to um, provide this as a resource as well. Recovery coordination, national disaster recovery, recovery framework. There's a framework. That framework does not take into consideration all the things we did with, dealt with with COVID, but it is a framework for us to do national response and capabilities um, in any kind of disaster. So COVID is the national response framework was stood up. Um, was run by FEMA, Homeland Security had charge over coordination in HHS because it was a health um, response, led the, the, the vast majority of all of the assets. And here are the HHS partners, as you, and this is, this is exactly how we ran this on um, COVID. You had FEMA under, under Homeland Security, we had DOD, VA, and other federal agencies as appropriate, and we had other partnerships with the American Red Cross, um, national advisory committees on cert certain diseases, um, also certain supply chain challenges, all those things came into play as well as coordination with the state and national stakeholders. Now, the role of nursing and preparedness and response, we get into the meat of the talk here now, and I'm at the end. Um, the role of the healthcare team in public health is, is to provide a direct care. And in response, in a, from a response standpoint, nurses are front and center. We're communicating with community leaders. We're translating the needs of clinical practice and clinical guidelines, and also working to engage with the community to make sure that education, education of the community in real time can be provided. And building off, off of COVID, contact tracing, a lot of that work was needed um, from a nursing standpoint, but also for follow-up and to have it warm handoff to the case manager or the home health provider. Nurses were specifically challenged and being able to meet the increased demand in that regard. Nurses were often called to lead the epidemiology conversations because providers needed to understand how many cases, um, how many more providers do I need and what needs to happen in the, um, in the community. And nurses were involved in, in negotiating for resources. PPE, PPE became a major challenge for us and we needed nurses at the helm. And I think this is something that we did well um, from a national standpoint, to hammer home. You cannot have nurses and other healthcare providers that are on the front line that don't have adequate PPE. And here is the list of things that we learned from this last, from the pandemic, is that we have to have nurses involved in community assessment and patient assessment, triage, clinical oversight, case management, the entire schema of care and treatment on that continuum of COVID, nurses were front and center and need to continue to be leaders, even more so as we go forward. As a matter of fact, we have a superstar in the nursing profession. I don't know if you know Dr. Tanner Venema, um, but she is a rock star in, in, this, in this space and is world renowned for her work on disaster and nurse, disaster nursing and emergency preparedness. She's done a lot of work in this space and, and served on several um, National Academies of Medicine reports. She's also written several books and um, I think she's still on faculty at Hopkins. Um, but Tenor always talks about the importance of the role of the public health professional. And she sees every, every nurse as being a public health professional because we start to see trends in the emergency room, the outpatient clinics and on the, on the units. And that information is very, very instructive when the health department doesn't have the epidemiologist or doesn't have a biostatistician. It is the nursing staff the nursing community, the leaders who understand how we can go from zero cases to full on pandemic very quickly. Um, making sure that healthcare, um, in the healthcare industry in general is aware of um, capacity. And I cannot tell you the importance of having lab capacity during the, the pandemic. Building, building that pipeline, rebuilding the pipeline is gonna be important. 
Um, there were a lot of labs and university campuses that had to be open to be able to process lab samples. That is something we'll have to think about. How do we build a plan for that in the future? And how do we develop a plan to handle outbreaks to unknown agents? Those things that we haven't even, haven't even fathomed yet. It is important for the clinical team to understand its use of uh, microbial agents as well, over prescribing of antibiotics and also under screening for certain conditions when you see that patients are being re re repeatedly um, admitted to the emergency room for an infectious, infectious disease. And here's, a, here's some research response guidance for nurse leaders, and I'll leave this with you. Be informed, be engaged, advocate, and educate. Um, we recognize things, and those things are important when we're trying to build a new system of public health, but it's also important for us to develop and implement strategies that will provide access to everyone. Everyone has a right to health care, and that's what we need to be focused going forward. So as we've journeyed through COVID, we've journeyed through several of the social determinants of health, we've learned a lot. And some of those lessons learned include things that we know in the, in the healthcare professional, in the, in, in the healthcare professional space, but also good in reminding ourselves. We have to have better training, we have to have awareness, and we have to consider ourselves a global citizen. Infectious disease has, it has no respect for borders. We saw it with HIV, we saw it with Ebola, and we're seeing it with COVID. We have to be able to communicate in, in terms of critical response. And we have to communicate in a way that all the partners understand the language. And I will tell you, um, we set up the Javits Center in New York and trying to speak to the army guys and they order a Navy ventilator because they have their two different supply chains. You have one hospital uses one IV pump, IV, IV pump, another one uses a different kind of IV pump, they don't use the same tubing. So if I want, you call me and say, send me a, a case of tubing, what happens? Yeah. It doesn't happen. You haven't solved the problem. So communication is going to be critical, um, not only now, but into the future. Public health is a national security priority. And National Security Council is very much interested in disease outbreaks. And we monitor this on an ongoing basis. There are secure briefings, um, as we say, high level briefings for those who have security clearance. We talk about where we see emerging diseases, where we see um, um, civil unrest, where we see things creeping across the border that look like, smell like fentanyl. Um, and how do you deal with those things? Biochem attacks, they're becoming a part of the, the normal conversation for leaders in this country. And nurses need to be a part of the understanding of what the threat levels are and what they mean and how to get translated into your community response. We have a fragile healthcare system in the United States, and we see a lot of that abroad. A lot of countries in Africa have very porous borders, and we're seeing that the porous borders do not only happen in third world countries. It happens here in the United States, but we're seeing at the border, both at, for um, Canada and also for the United States, creates a threat for us. Um, COVID taught us that you cannot live in a world where you do not consider all points of entry as a threat. Um, and we have to be prepared for anything. The comprehensive approach is going to be critical. We can teach each other a lot on an interprofessional team, but it's always easier if we've trained together, we've learned together, and we've practiced together. It makes it much easier in a, in a disaster, in an, a pandemic, to pivot and be able to use, your lever, use those levers off of each other's skills to get to a successful outcome of the mission. I do believe that nurses possess the skills to be leaders in preparedness and response domestically and internationally. I've seen it work. And the beauty of it is that we don't have to teach nurses a whole lot to be able to function in any of these environments. My key takeaways for you today are, the, are as, as, as follows. Be deliberate and inclusive in planning. It is critical for you to understand how um, the response framework works and what your role may be in the event that you're called to lead a mission, a task, or to respond to something happening in your community. Identify priority areas. What are the things that you feel are vulnerable in your community, in your hospital, or even within your educational um, environment? Engage as a partner with stakeholders to identify community needs. And this is basically having a conversation. If you don't know who the faith-based leaders are in your community, if you don't know who the business owners are, this is a place where nurses can be an advocate. They can be the, the game changer for having people involved and engaged in the process 
who do not feel that they're part of public health. And creating different outreach models to reach people who have not been a part of the conversation before, and especially for people who live in certain geographic, um, geographic areas, rural comes to mind, frontier comes to mind, but also those with disabilities and those who are just left out of the healthcare market. Um, solicit feedback, ask people, did you feel part of this response? Did you feel that your voices were heard? Did, you, did your needs get met? And if not, how do we improve? How do we engage? And you have to evaluate that constantly. And last but not least, utilize the resources and technical assistance that are available. FEMA has a plethora of resources that are available to you. And I would suggest that if you haven't had the training that you access that training. And last but not least, I'll leave you with a quote from Ben Franklin. By failing to prepare, you are preparing to fail. Thank you for your time and attention today. It's been a pleasure to be with you. Very much, Dr. Adams. I think what we're going to do now is pivot to uh, questions and answers, and we're going to rotate to the here in the room. And so there are mics that are set up, so feel free to uh, sort of make your way to the mic. And then also, we have some questions that are uh, coming in online. Uh, your presentation actually reminded me of March 24th, is actually World TV Day. And so I think it's a very important day to keep in mind that there are people that are welcome to the so thank you for your presentation. Uh, you've talked a couple times about the power of diplomacy and the humanitarian crisis. The humanitarian crisis that's happening as, as a result of the war in Ukraine has resulted in about 3.4 million displaced persons. And unfortunately, we know that Ukraine has the second highest rate of persons with HIV in Europe. And they also have the hot second highest rate of multi-drug resistant tuberculosis in the globe. And so when you talked about a re-emerging infectious disease, I hope the NATO leaders and the EU leaders and the G7 leaders that are meeting today in the next few days are thinking about the re-emerging infectious disease that most likely will speak across Eastern Europe. Thank you for raising it. And I think it's very timely and important because we saw the same thing happen. It happened in the 80s, and we saw that significant spike, and a lot of it was because of migratory patterns changing. We had a refugee crisis, several back-to-back, -back, and we had displaced people from other countries coming to the United States, and then we, our homeless population was skyrocketed. And so in the homeless population, we specifically saw those cases. I do think we're going to have some significant challenges from those displaced populations in Ukraine, not just in Europe, but across other borders in other countries because of the migratory patterns. We've already seen people leave the country, but also leave the continent. And so those are going to be challenges that we have to face going forward. And I don't know that our, our public health system is prepared for that here in the United States, let alone abroad in some of those very um, challenged countries that don't have the public health infrastructure. We have a fragile infrastructure, but there are countries that have no infrastructure. So thank you. So Dr. Trinidad, we're going to take a question from someone online. Or so John is asking, can you address specific ways you think nurses can better prepare for the adverse effects of climate change on health? Thank you, John, for that question. I do think that nurses can be um, preparing ourselves. And a lot of it is understanding what's happening with the changes in climate. We're seeing more frequent um, storms and more, more vigorous storms. We're seeing um, agriculture being impacted. So if nurses understanding, let's just start with your own community. If you live in a farm community, especially in parts of the country that are having severe drought, what is it that you can do to educate those people in the community about what's happening and how it's going to impact their livelihoods, um, how it's gonna affect the health, and what is it doing to the environment in their communities? That, that educational component of nursing, I think would be very important. But taking a leadership role, working with the health department, working with the leaders in that community to understand that this is connected to A, B, or C as it relates to climate change. And here is how I can help to educate, inform, and here's, what, here's the partnerships that we can build from an interprofessional standpoint. 
we can't do it alone. And I, I don't want to see this become another challenge for nurses to address. Um, but I do think that nurses need to be, able to be at the table and need to be able to share their knowledge and their information. So being informed, being engaged, and taking a leadership role. Thank you, Dr. Trent Adams. Um, I'm curious about your perspective on kind of uh, potential risks or opportunities for moving from a pandemic kind of response to an endemic uh, approach. Um, and I bring that just because uh, legislative grants is looking at or not funding the continued process of, of that preparedness and response. And I'm curious if you can take that from a nursing perspective, the exacerbation of you know, burnout under resource. Um, so thank you. So thank you for that question. So let's, let's deal with the, um, the impact on the nursing profession um, as it relates to the, becoming more from a pandemic to endemic. I think this is gonna lead to a very significant, exacerbated shortage of nurses in the profession. Nurses are burnt out, they're fed up, they're tired, and they're leaving. In addition to the fact that we have a lot of nurses in this country who are retirement age, and the risk that COVID brought um, was a wake-up call. And many of them are choosing to protect themselves and their families by making that decision that I can't be in this environment and, and continue to risk my lives. My, my, the lot, my life, the lives of my family, and the lives of, my, of the visitors of my community. So that's one thing. But we're not ready for that. But I do think that the, the you're, you're correct. There's, there are plans to not fund activities as it relates to the pandemic response going forward. But there are plans to figure out how do we make this or incorporate this into ongoing care. And that's going to be a primary care call because we have to be able to manage not only the acute illness and the continued spread, but the downstream effects of COVID the cardiovascular, the, the, the pulmonary, and also just the systemic stress and mental health burden that this has created is going to be significant, not just for nurses, but for the entire population. And I, I, I worry about it, but the children, those kids who were in, in, in school who did not have resources, uh, and especially those kids who were of form, in their formative ages. I think the younger kids are gonna be okay. They're pretty resilient and they were protected from, shielded from some of the information. Those kids who are in high school and college, I do think it's going to have a significant impact. And what that means for us is fewer people may be choosing nursing as a profession. And um, those that were headed in our direction may be making a U-turn somewhere else. And then those who are in nursing school may be not so enthused about going into clinical practice. They may continue their education, but maybe not pursuing um, the clinical space. So, Dr. there are a number of questions online, so I'm going to try to pull them together. All right. Let me know if I can hold the time. So your question is really about leadership and what guidance would you provide nurses around uh, being more involved in public health leadership. Related to that is a question regarding sort of preparedness in our, in our academic programs. How do we infuse uh, public health preparedness in our academic programs? And then there's a third part um, that's about misinformation. And so the where we are right now, but there's a lot of misinformation in terms of public health uh, institutions and trust. How do we use data and how do we use nursing as a way that's a good um, Let me start with the first one, public health leadership. So how do nurses get involved in public health leadership opportunities? Um, there are training opportunities. I would strongly recommend any nurse um, do a legislative or a policy rotation as a part of their career development, their opportun opportunities while they're in the undergraduate program, get in that space to understand what's in the black box, what is behind the green curtain, because it helps to frame your mind about how policy is derived, how it gets implemented, and the negotiations that have to happen in order for a policy to, to, see, its, to see the light of day. And what I mean by that is being a, a fellow on the hill, a scholar on the hill, be, just do a two week rotation as an intern, something to give you a feel for what that world looks like. That's a, the first thing. The second thing is get more information about public health in general. If you, you wanna do a dual degree and, and do a master's at, in public health or do something in the public health space um, more formally, that's one way to do it. But volunteering on a health department, getting, getting an opportunity to see behind the, the, behind the machine of public health 
you will see how the county, the state operates. You'll see how they, whether they prioritize or not public health and how that impacts your ability to do your job as a clinician or as a researcher. And here's what I mean by that. If there is no um, value seen in doing surveillance, and if you don't have a strong public health department, you're going to see more people showing up in your emergency room in crisis, especially during a pandemic, because there's no capacity, there's no infrastructure to manage it anywhere in, anywhere else other than in, in, in that space. So understanding how that works. Preparedness in the curriculum. So I will say that there are some uh, certifications that are available online. There are also some opportunities to volunteer with a number of organizations around how to get out into, how to better understand public health and preparedness. Red Cross is a great one. Uh, I'm an advocate for Red Cross volunteers. Um, the nurses that have mentored me over my, my career have often said Red Cross helped, to help them to understand disaster in a different way. And you can do it at your volunteer and, and only do those things that you're able to do, but commit to learning something about how disasters happen and actively engage. Jump in, just do it and figure out how you can build upon those skill sets by having some real boots on the ground experience. It does change your view of the world. Um, and then misinformation, um, data and trust. So we've gone backwards. I think we've lost trust in the CDC, we've lost trust in government, we've lost trust in health, we've lost trust in public health. We have to use the power of the nurse. Nurses are the most trusted profession in the country if not in the world. And we are potentially, maybe, the only profession that the community will really listen to. So I think that there are a lot of things that nurses can do at the local level, starting with your own family. Your family, your friend circle, your, your, your church, your synagogue, your mosque, wherever you, wherever you have contact with people, sharing the message about the importance of public health and what the, what the right information is. So first of all, we need to get educated on what the right information is. And then being able to share that in a way that people can understand it and accept it. What happens a lot of times is there are these sound bites that really have dual meanings and people will interpret based on their own views or perspectives. But when you present evidence and you give it, make it personal and you connect with people, then you can help to build trust and hopefully get them to understand what information is accurate, what information is not accurate. When we live in a microwave society, we all look up every, we Google everything. <laughs> and Google will bring up the good and the bad, the true and the not true. So we have to be careful in how we um, provide tools and resources to people or tell them to Google X. Um, make, that, make that personal connection. That makes a difference in them being able to understand and change their perspectives. Thank you very much. Please join me in the our reception in the courtyard. There is actually food inside. Feel free to step outside and enjoy some time with Dr. Jen Adams. I want to say thank you to everyone who was involved in the preparation of today's successful event. So to your team, uh, everyone in the IT, Drew. Jana, uh, thank you so much. It was really terrific and a huge success for our school. Wonderful to see people in person. I'm very, very happy that when you're here face to face, Ron, thank you for coming to us.